And Zach, he's the head of go-to-market for OpenAI, has a successful track record leading sales, revenue, and go-to-market functions over his 10-year-plus career in tech. And of course, there's no shortage of buzz and excitement about OpenAI's advancements with ChatGPT, Dolly, and their expanding partnership with Microsoft and more. So we all can't wait to hear what's in store from OpenAI in 2023. And I know everyone wants to get right to it. So thanks and welcome, Zach, from OpenAI. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for uh, making the time. I, uh, I have a deck. We, we, I'll go through it. Um, everyone has updated pretty quickly in the last even few weeks on what OpenAI is. And given the nature of what we're building, there's only so much that I can talk about. That said, I'll move through the gears and then we'll leave a bunch of time, hopefully for questions. Um, if I can't answer something, I'll just say I can't answer it. And the extent to which I can provide my own personal opinion, um, I, I'll caveat it that you know it is just my personal opinion. Um, but but hopefully hopefully the content in the meantime is valuable. Okay, um, we start all of our we start every presentation by reminding people um, that uh, OpenAI's mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity, um, and I think more than ever that's uh, an important thing to reiterate. M Microsoft is is on that journey with us. Um, our customers are on that journey with us. And uh, I think keeping that front and center is a reminder of why alignment is such an important problem. Trust and safety is such an important problem, sort of above and beyond um, what commercialization does and, and, and what go-to-market does, which, which really is to enable this mission. Um, okay, so I... I do think some of what I'll tell today is probably obvious, but it's it bears repeating because I think, um, yeah, it's it's helpful for everyone to sort of remember what OpenAI is, is trying to, how we're basically trying to go to market, and and what you should expect from us, and then and ideally it'll frame some of the uh, you know follow on questions. Um, the platform, which is the API, hosts our technologies via API endpoints to allow developers. Uh, tools to build transformative products and services, and the platform um, is our is is our primary go to market today. So while ChatGPT has taken the world by storm, um, you know Dolly Labs did the same. Most of most of our customers, um, certainly those that, that pay money, engage with us through the API, and we see this as as sort of the the foundation of the um, of the business because we want to enable the products and services. Um, that that reach the masses, and so our, our the platform strategy remains our, uh, our our primary focus. But I'll talk about um, what else you can expect from us uh, this coming year. The platform today has, and and many of you know this, um, uh, you know, a, a set of what we call modalities, and the you know the 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 the, the crown jewel of those modalities is GPT. Um, which has gone through its uh, various iterations. And of course, the GPT-3 that you all know today is very different than the GPT-3 that we started selling when I joined two years ago. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it is the same name, but, but, but really it doesn't share many other similarities. It, it's so updated from the original. And GPT is a large language model that can generate, summarize, extract, interpret, transform, now translate very well for those of you who haven't tried it. Um, translation is really good and search text. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about how, about how it's searched. We talk about these um, as sort of a capability matrix. So every modality at OpenAI that you can access in the endpoint enables these capabilities. And when we talk to founders, developers, large enterprises, you'll, we use these words um, as sort of the most discrete way to describe the capability, um, the capability taxonomy. Codex. Um, it's a large language model that has been trained using open source code that can generate, explain, translate, optimize, and fix code. Um, a lot of people here have, and have interacted with Copilot on which uh, Codex is trained. You can also access Codex uh, through the API um, and, and build uh, similar or exciting products. Dolly 2. Um, Dolly 2 is a large model that has been trained using licensed image data that can generate and edit images. And what's exciting about Dolly, and most people don't know this, I think still because labs, um, the, the application layer didn't showcase this, 
Dolly is now available in the API um, and Dolly API can actually do some pretty incredible things. So everyone knows about the text to image capabilities that it has creating a castle in Ireland with the yellow water polo slide, et cetera. You know, th this was very exciting six months ago. This is almost old hat now. Um, and, and we, you know, we accept that that's how fast the world is moving, but the Dolly in painting um, and variations capabilities are really exciting. So this is what's enabling a lot of really exciting uh, work within our customers' applications who, you know, power various um, design design tools. Um, and, you know, a lot, again, a lot of you have sort of interacted with, with Dolly in the labs environment, but but maybe you're not familiar with, with the API offering. Um, and uh, variations is obviously a, re a really exciting um, uh, feature uh, with Dolly. Um, Whisper. So Whisper goes live in the API next week, I think. Um, uh, it's a large model that's been trained using licensed speech data. And by the way, these this is not some subtweet. I'm not saying licensed. It's just important to note that like we are, um, our models are are trained on licensed data, um, and and the you know the the models themselves are are very above board. Um, that can transcribe and interpret speech. Um, and uh, Whisper is a state-of-the-art um, uh, ASR product. We also have, although not in the API, um, uh, uh, Clip, which uh, can turn uh, an image into text. Um, many of you may have interacted with it um, embedded in other models. It's, it's open source. Whisper, by the way, is also open source, um, but, but we are going to host it in the API per, per popular demand. Um, so, so we have these four modalities. This year, we're going to continue to add modalities. Um, so you can expect to see text to fill in the blank or fill in the blank to text. Um, most models will be, will be bi-directional. You can also expect to see us upgrade uh, each of these modalities. So, you know, there are tons of rumors flying around um, about Dolly 2.1. When will it come out? I'm kidding. Um, but, but, but we will expect, uh, we, we probably will upgrade um, uh, each of these modalities uh, throughout the year. And then there are a bunch of advanced API endpoints, and I think this is probably what separates um, what separates the the API today. You know, in addition to just the the, the strength of of GPT three and three point five, um, our instruction following, our fine tuning, our embeddings v two, and edit and insert endpoints, um, really really competitive advantages for our customers. And for those of you who haven't explored these endpoints, I strongly encourage you to do so um, because they um, they can help you not only differentiate you know our service versus versus other large language models, but your own service. So um, you know fine tuning is a great way to take advantage of your data. Embeddings is an incredible way to take advantage of your data. Edit and insert allows and, and instruction following allow for really rich prompt engineering um, and application differentiation. You could also probably expect from us some more advanced API endpoints this year. Um, you know, imagine a world where maybe um, uh, you know we give more uh, access to weights um, to allow for for more customizability um, by ML engineers. Um, that that that's that's something that's pretty high priority for us. Or a world potentially where where you have um, dedicated capacity. Okay, and then of course we have ChatGPT, and this is sort of like a teaser to you know what Sam has tweeted about. So this is public domain, and, and I'm not saying anything new. Oh, our you know first party product. What will what will the world look like where you know where OpenAI is is distributing an application itself? Um, and ChatGPT is a web app powered by a customized GPT 3.5 engine, which by the way all of you have access to. And so anytime someone gets excited, you know how do I build? ChatGPT, we say, well, you know, the, the endpoint is available. Admittedly, the ChatGPT API endpoint itself is not yet available, but the 3.5 endpoint exists, and you can, um, you know, you can you can use it today, and you can generate, summarize, extract, interpret, transform, and translate text in a beautiful web app. Um, and and you know, this was an amazing learning for us because we truly re we, we launched it as a research preview, and um, people got really you know, really excited. My mom included. And it's sort of updated everyone, you know, um, well, I suppose it served as a reminder that <clears throat> the application layer is really important and how people engage with these models is almost just as important as the models themselves, right? The, the more things change, the more they stay the same, the, the software, the, the, the application experience uh, matters a ton.
Um, I'm going to pause. I have more content, but the truth is usually what happens is we fill up a bunch of this time with questions. Um, I'm, I'm again, happy to answer anything that I, that I can answer. Um, I, and I, you know, if I can, I'll just, I'll just be blunt and tell you, look, I, I, I can't answer this given that this content is going to be shared. There's, there's not much that we can do in terms of, um, demo and previews, but, but I'll, but I'll speak to whatever I can around, um, around anything else. All right, Zach, we've got a bunch of questions for you, um, and I'll start kind of firing them off. Um, so one is from uh, from Bach, what is the main difference between the models underlying GPT-3 and chat GPT? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, GPT has a family of models. Um, I'll just stop sharing. It's probably easier. Um, GPT has a family of models, um, which you've probably seen on the website. Um, they sort of, you know, there's, there's GBT3, Ada, Da Vinci, Curie, Babbage. Um, then we, we've updated uh, now to, to have Da Vinci 003, which is, which is effectively 3.5. ChatGBT um, is a slightly al more aligned and updated model that actually just is, is trained on, on, on dialogue. So it's a, it's a, it's a model that's really specifically designed to sort of interact with you as a, as a human would in the form of speech, which is why it feels like a like a more natural chat bot and i think why people are so inclined to it but it actually is mostly just uh da vinci 003 thank you another question here um will open ai continue to focus on the foundational models or do you see an evolution over time to building custom uh more custom apps yeah um so so i think uh the focus will will almost always exclusively on foundation models um, and you can imagine us just sort of filling out that that modality tree. So like, you know, think about the other ways that humans engage with the world. We hear, we speak, um, we touch, et cetera. There, there's probably a robotics component. but but the truth is, we will probably always focus on the general um, the general models. We want other people to to do the rest. I think from a um, application standpoint, you can imagine a very gen a generic first party product. Um, like a chat GPT that, that, I mean, I think, I, I think the, I think the word is out. We're sort of um, distributing it now um, in a, in a pro version. Um, but it probably is never going to become something that, um, you know, fulfills a very specific task in your life in, in part, because we want, we want the platform to enable people to build those products. Uh, and, and also in part, because it's, it's probably just not, um, yeah, it's, it, it's not in pursuit of AGI. <clears throat> right. When will Codex be fully released? Right now it's in beta and there's a request limit. You've heard this one? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to still get this question. Uh, very soon. I think um, on, behalf of, on behalf of the team, we, we want this. We, we, we want to release this. It, um, there's no good excuse. It sh it, we, we, we should get it out. And, and I'm told soon. Um, if you, if for for those of you on this, um, and those of you listening, if you're building something exciting with Codex and you run up, you run up against a rate limit or something like that, please email us, um, and you can email me zach at openai.com, and we'll happily try to unblock you. That's great. I know people appreciate that. Uh, big news today: uh, expanded partnership with Microsoft investment. Um, an indication that more and more open AI will, will live in Microsoft products and services. What can you share about that relationship and what we expect to see um, throughout this year? Yeah, it's, um, uh, I, you know, it's really exciting for a lot of reasons. I think um, not least of which is that Microsoft has sort of continued to prove that it is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a titan of industry that has sort of outlasted and sort of will continue to outlast a lot of companies for a lot of reasons, not least of which is their, you know, foresight in, on a product basis, their, their go-to-market prowess, um, their, their, their engineering chops. They have been an incredible partner to, to my team, to the product team, obviously Sam and Satya have a, have a, have a really meaningful relationship. I think that, I think that everyone should expect there to be um, co-product development, co, um, co-marketing, co-enterprise development, you know, they've, they've announced their Azure offering, which, which we're really excited to support. Um, and, 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 and we do. So I think, um, 
yeah, I, th I think it's probably just a, a springboard and a catalyst to a lot of really exciting work. That's great. Uh, given chat G uh, GPT got HIPAA compliance today, how does OpenAI plan to create healthcare solutions? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, talk about one way that that Azure, that Microsoft could could supercharge OpenAI, right? So the Azure OAI service will, I think is, if it's not already, it's going to be HIPAA compliant. I'm embarrassed, I don't know. Um, but I'm almost certain if it's not, it will be very soon. This is going to be something that they just sprint at faster than us. HIPAA compliance requires, I mean, just a bunch of red tape and it's not our, it is of a few hours ago. Great. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andre. But uh, I think, yeah, so this is going to be one of these areas where, you know, they're going to enable a bunch of work that we couldn't because there's red tape that they, you know, it's a, it's a Goliath. They can cut through that, that stuff faster and they're sort of designed to as a business. Um, that said, I think, you know, I mean, healthcare is a, you know, God, I mean, I don't think there's anyone thing that thinks it's an industry that isn't right for disruption. The question is, you know, does it happen on the provider side? Does it happen on the, on the insurers? Like, where does it come from and who's actually incentivized? I mean, this is the, the question we ask a lot at, at you know, at that opening eye, like who's actually incentivized to help drive this forward. Um, and that, that, that is unclear to me, but you know, Microsoft will certainly help their their customers who are trying to do it cut through a lot of the a lot of the compliance red tape. You know, we have this audience as builders, creators, founders, right? Um, we have uh, seventy plus participants at this event. What what advice would you give them about you know where to focus? I mean, what what are you, what do you find compelling in terms of new applications on the horizon which would really benefit from uh, OpenAI's foundational models? Yeah. Okay. So I have, there's a party, there, there, I, there's a bunch of party lines, but I will, I'm just going to give my personal spin because I, I think that's important for my, my personal opinion. Everyone, everyone in this room who's ever invested money has lost money in ed tech, but I actually think this is the opportunity. I think now is the time where people start making money. Like I, I know that people have been saying that about ed tech for years. I don't even see people like listed. Like I don't even see Sequoia listed as like a, as like a, uh, consideration anymore in there, in there, but like, I actually think that now is the time to invest in ed tech, to build it, to put money into it. Um, the confident, you know, consumer confidence in public education is an all time low sort of across political and socioeconomic spectrums. Students in, you know, America's falling behind um, on, on education standards. Universities are getting harder and harder to get into for no good reason other than NIMBYism. So it's like, okay, obviously this is ripe. And then all of a sudden this thing comes along that can, you know, we could build customized tutors. Um, uh, we could, you know, we, we, we can we can do like on the fly testing. Y you can imagine a world where like, you know, kids who don't want to wake up at seven in the morning can now learn at the hours that they're excited to learn because teachers are willing, you know, their customized tutors willing to stay awake with them all night. And I think it starts slow, right? Like, I don't think that people wake up one day and go chat GPT is my teacher now. But I think you could easily imagine a world where like the average American high school student uh, or junior high school, school student has a private tutor powered by AI that knows how they learn, that knows where they're struggling, that can give their, their parents recommendations um, and, and, you know, can sort of like update them on, on how they're performing. That's going to happen. And I don't think it's like, you know, one you know, winner take all. I think it's going to happen across a few different modalities. So, so I'm really excited about ed tech and, and I think there's probably no more noble of a cause. Um, look, if I, if I were going to start a company tomorrow, there's probably two that I would start. The first is I would, uh, I would, I think there's management consulting for everyone to be built here. Like imagine the scale of a research and advisory firm like Gartner or Forrester. So take all of their data and like the um, nuance and customization of a Bain at McKinsey and, you know, embed all of these Harvard business reviews and all this data, and then, you know, sell at, on a, on a subscription basis, a, you know, on-call consultant to main street, you know, uh, you know, you know, a family that owns three IHOPs and as they're trying to figure out how to, you know, better price their menu. I mean, this should exist. This will, this will improve quality of businesses, this will improve quality of life, um, likelihood of success. Everyone's got an interest in this because small businesses default. 
banks, you know, banks can't uh, manage that. So, you know, I, I would, I would probably go start, I would probably go start that. And then I think, you know, and there's all this like talk on Twitter, like is prompt engineering going to be a business? I don't know, but I do think that there's a huge business. Um, there's a huge cottage industry around helping supporting people who are building applications um, and trying to disrupt uh, using using this technology. And I think just generally becoming an expert in it will serve people pretty well. Uh, so that's my, yeah, that's that's my, I mean, the big one obviously is search. The party line, I think this is gonna transform search. Um, and I think everyone, search and e-commerce, I think everyone believes are gonna you know, pretty quickly change. And, and by the way, I, agree. I I don't disagree. I just, I like to give my own spin. That was great. So and we have, we have a founder who brought an idea in EdTech that's beaming right now, Radic. Um, so you're, you made some you made some people's days to, today with that. Um, so that's that's fantastic. Uh, we've got another question here about fine tuned models might become increasingly important as competitive advantage for business. Um, will there be any difference in using um, fine tuned models uh, versus the original models in terms of uh, I'm thinking around difference in cost and in service. Let me answer what I think what I think is being asked, but I could I just I just I might be totally off. So basically, like uh, one of the questions I'll answer the question that I get asked most often about fine tune models. The, the the risk with fine tune models is that if you go fine tune your own model, the risk is that OpenAI launches another version, like a like the next version of GBT, and you're like, oh, this my fine you know I put all this money and all this work into this fine tune model, and now it's sort of obsolete. And like we do apologize for that, and and like that's actually not optimal. Um, but I don't, I do think, and, and I do think that zero shot is going to become more and more common. But there is like a next, there's like a uh, we're working on sort of like the next evolution of fine tuning, which I can't tease much more than that. But the idea is that we would actually give more power to an ML engineer using our foundational model. Um, and allow your data as the enterprise to be even more valuable than it is today. So imagine sort of like a, a fine-tuned experience, but but much more robust. Um, and I think that is, you know, we we want to make it very easy for our customers to differentiate from us and from each other. Otherwise, it, it gets really, really murky and really crowded. So, um, and regarding cost, yeah, fine-tuned is definitely more expensive, but I think on the whole, it should be worth, like if it works, it should be, it should be well worth it. That's great. Another question here about more about the future, kind of this theme of what happens with OpenAI in this year in 2023. Um, do you see a, a different ex product extensions, things we're not asking you about, that, that, but that could be on the horizon that'd be interesting? Is there anything you're not asking me about that is on the horizon and interesting? Yes. <laughs> uh, am I going to talk about it here? No. Um, I, um, uh, I think that what people don't, what, what a lot of people don't realize right now is how fast the large enterprises are moving. So the one thing that I, the one thing that I updated on in the last, so we thought that this year was going to be a slog with the enterprise and that these start and that, and, and startups were going to sort of race out in front. And then there was going to be a bunch of acquisition activity and like people are going to get caught by surprise. And I think what's good for everyone, honestly, is that everyone is updating quickly and moving fast, um, which I think is like a rising tide that will float most boats. But I've been very surprised by how quickly, you know, usual suspects, like if, if you had said to me, hey, who are, the, who are the 50 companies that you think should be adopting this? I would have put together a wish list and sort of laughed about, you know, is their CEO, you know, is, you know, is so-and-so actually going to get on board with this? And then you see, you know, Benioff, you know, like, you know, rage tweeting about, you know, about chat GPT. And it's like, yeah, actually people are updating really quickly and product teams are mobilizing. Um, so I think that's going to be pretty exciting for the end consumer because all of our, I, I hope and expect that most of our experiences or most of our like product experiences are going to, are going to update quickly. I think for founders, it's just more, you know, it's just fuel. Like it means that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're skating to where the puck is going um, and you just got to build differentiated experiences because what these enterprises have is distribution. What you have is no product debt. And, you know, it, it's not clear which one's more valuable. Great. Here's a question. You know, Matt spoke in the last session about, um, you know, middleware layer as an interesting investment channel. What do you think about that? I mean, how do you think about it in terms of uh, on top of foundation models and your partnerships with 
uh, these various emerging companies? Um, yeah, everyone in this, most people in this room know more about middleware than I do. I like roughly know what the term means. So I'm not going to pretend to, to, to know what, what uh, ML middleware actually looks and feels like. I will say that I think the industry, I'm not even going to call it cottage, the ecosystem around, um, you know, I already saw someone today t um, tweet about instead of ML ops, they tweeted LLM ops. And that's like now a, a big thing. That's happened seem, not seemingly overnight, but like very quickly. I am sure that many of these companies will become very big. Um, and we are really excited to work with all of them. And, 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 and um, you know, I, I take as many meetings now as I can with folks in the ecosystem to figure out how we can help and how we can get people introduced to our customers. Um, and our general opinion is like, great, b build and, and let us help you or, or tell us what we can do better. Um, and in many sense, you know, many respects, I, I take these calls to dispel a lot of this like closed AI um, myth because, um, you know, we, we're, we're really trying to to work inside of the ecosystem uh, well. Great. Matt mentioned Langchain. Uh, we also have Dusk presenting uh, later this week, so we can go deeper uh, throughout the week on that. I think this is an interesting question. Um, if every app relies on chat GPT, uh, it, it could hurt diversity and creativity. Um, how does OpenAI plan to mitigate this risk? I, you know, it won't surprise anyone in this room. I don't think that that's, uh, I don't think that the risk of AI is, is, is going to, well, actually maybe it would, I don't know, but um, I, I'm generally more of an optimist period. So, so uh, that's, th those are my, that's my prior. And I am, I don't worry too much about the future. Um, I never have, but like, I, I don't, I certainly don't today. There, I see so much hand wringing. Right? I mean, I guess I see a lot of hand wringing around how are these models going to like, you know, students are going to cheat more, and what about art? And it's like this same hand wringing happened when when we got the internet. Like I remember very people were like, you know, what are all these kids going to? You know, all these kids are going to see all these bad things, and um, I think it's true that there will be weird consequences to this. And one of them may be that students use this to plagiarize content or like to create works that are not their own. But I think that that cost, like if you're, if you're willing to separate the cost of that single, like, like, like um, the short-term, you know, uh, weird events that we sort of update to, the long-term implications seem far more exciting around like, allowing access to people who like, I mean, we had someone the other day, who, you know, write in, hey, I, I'm ADHD, I, I can't concentrate at school. I've never been able to finish a paper. I've never been able to sit down for more than 15 minutes and write. And like, I can sit down and write now. Like I have all these like incredible ideas coming, flooding my mind. We, we had a guy, I was in tears. We had, we had someone write in to say, I'm paraplegic, I'm writing in uh, I, I, I've authored this note. This is one of the, this is the longest letter I've written in, in like nine years, um, you know, using, using your prompt. And I, we were like, holy shit. And at that point, I'm like, okay, I don't need to hear any more hand wringing. Like in the same way that people didn't, you know, the hand wringing about the car and the hand wringing about, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the internet. The hand wringing about nuclear that we all, you know, fell victim to. Like there have been a lot of like these seminal moments where people are like, what if? And it's like, yeah. And also we're going to unlock a ton of creativity and a ton of opportunity that we just can't imagine right now. And on a related note, a popular question came through, you know, what is your strategy around handling bias in the training data? That's so that's a great question. And something that I do think there's like, uh, like the appropriate amount of hand wringing. Generally safety and alignment gets the attention that it deserves. I'm not the, I'm not a safety and alignment expert. I can or a policy expert. I can say that, um, and so I, I won't say much to it. But what I can say is that OpenAI obviously has prioritized this, and we have um, a, a lot of leadership um, and a lot of firepower around these issues. Bias is something that you know we've worked a lot on, and I think if you you know now if you look at Dolly, if you if you if you work inside of Chat GPT, you'll see it starts to default to, to far more um, neutral, you know, genders, races, et cetera, than, than it did when we launched. And so we're constantly updating the model and it's, you know, 
it's a, it's a, I think it will be a persistent challenge for a long time. Yeah. I think there's a good question here. How you differentiate GPT-3 API versus chat GPT API? What type of applications would you use for one versus the other? So um, GPT-3 comes in, you know, a few flavors, right? Uh, Dolly, DaVinci, or da DaVinci, Ada, Babbage, Curie. Um, there are uh, more supercharged um, engines on the site. My strong suggestion, instead of telling you how they differentiate, is to go try them. Like, go use them for your application, see how they perform. Um, there will be, there, there, there probably will be the uh, chat GPT API available. But again, and I say this to everyone, it's it's just DaVinci series. You, you can get access to it today with a little bit of work. You can basically get the chat GPT results. Um, and I encourage everyone, because I, I without knowing what you're actually trying to build, to just try each model and see what see what serves you best. Okay. So I want to come back to edtech. You mentioned that as a scenario. Like in your personal opinion, you would go after. And this is the time. Uh, maybe at the technology unlock, the the need for innovative approaches to to education. But how do you work with academia? You know, in this time now where they're banning GPT, uh, Chat GPT, and schools and in colleges. How do you reconcile those two things? Um, uh, what's the, the party line? I mean, we, yeah, there, there's going to be some weird, uh, there, there are going to be some reactions to this stuff that I think is, is, I think really important to understand, but on the whole, I mean, look, what people are, what, what, it seems like what people are worried about is that they don't understand how it's being used. And so a lot of what we need to do is help update the, the policymakers and, the, and these, these institutions. Um, and, and there's a lot of work being done right now at OpenAI on, 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 that, on that basis. It, it's not happening on our team, but, but it's happening. I think that um, the opportunity in ed tech is for the providers of the, the you know the publishers, the technology providers, the educators themselves, to sort of like prevail over the over like the the, the, the you know the the inherent inertia in these systems. Like I think ban you know New York City school district banning ChatGPT that's actually like it's not a that's that's like a feature of this. Like it, it's like you know first they you know it's like a it's a kickback. But it but I think when you hear the teachers talk about how they're using it. To, both, to help grade tests, to help inspire more, you know, better ideas, to help them write curriculums, you suddenly start to realize like, okay, this is probably a short-term, um, this is probably a short-term swing. The other thing, and this is what I will say to anyone working in EdTech, and this is the, this is my personal opinion, just go sell to the parents. I mean, you know, who's not trying to ban this? Parents. Like, parents are like, yeah, cool, anything to help my kid, you know, you know, you know, learn more, like ha have, have a, have a private tutor experience. And I think at a time where, you know, trust and trust in the overall education system is pretty low, it's a pretty great opportunity to go approach parents. And then honestly, if you can build a big enough system, you, you, you know, you start to like give this to, to kids who can't afford it. And, and, and then it's like, it's not really the school district's opportunity to ban anymore. Honestly, I, I agree with you. These are the tools of the future. Um, kids need to know how to use them and leverage them in the right ways. So I'm, I'm with you on all those things. Uh, question from Sam. Uh, I worry about the spread of mis disinformation through foundation models. Do you have thoughts on how we can mitigate the potential for this in the future? Um, yeah, misinformation is one of the many things, well, one of the few big things that policy alignment, public policy, product policy, and safety all work on together. And it's yeah, it's just a huge, I mean, you know, if you try to, if you try to write like political speech, I mean, ChatGPT has a lot of guardrails for good reason. And, um, you know, this is, this is one of the things, I think it's one of the risks with open source models, quite honestly, which is like, you know, everyone's clamoring for this stuff to be publicly, you know, open source, but it's like, okay, at what cost? And misinformation is so fresh and, you know, cause a lot of uh, complications in this country. And I think it's, pretty important that we um, be really careful about what these models can do before we just, um, you know, let people do anything with them. 
kind of gives back to me a little bit back to the ed tech. There was another question that came in about creating plagiarism detection software kind of gets, gets back into some of the things that, um, you know, some of the, some of the colleges and, and, and schools are worried about. Is that something you think about getting into kind of creating those types of uh, features and capabilities? We, uh, no, well, I shouldn't say no. We, we um, there are like holistic solutions to um the, the, you know, the, the problem is knowing whether something has been created by AI, right? Like that is like the, 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 the global problem. And there are a lot of solutions to that or a few solutions to that, you know, well, I, I, I won't even, I won't even extrapolate. You can sort of guess at them. Um, and then the question is like, does, should the solution exist on, on our end, on the front end or sort of on the back end with, with someone else? Lots of people are, are, are sort of thinking about this problem. Again, I think this will be a solved problem in the not too distant future. I think uh, it will, you know, we will have tools to sort of know if something is human created or not. And um, and certainly it's like pretty critical when it comes to academic work. I also think you can imagine a future where AI starts to get cited and is actually a contributor um, in academia. It's interesting. Question from Nikhil, are there plans for making GPT models perform better in non-English languages, specifically low resource languages? It's such a good question. It's near and dear to my heart. I spent four years prior to this at, um, at uh, a, a large language model uh, for the purposes of, of machine translation company. Um, yes, there's a lot of work that has gone into future models being much better at um, uh, translation. And low resource and exotic languages are included. Um, uh, and I think there is a really exciting future where all of our modalities are fluent in, you know, in basically most written or all written languages. From Justin, how do you think the industry can reward people who contributed the raw data, text images on which the models are trained on? I, I don't have a good answer to this question and I never have in part because it's hard for me to know, like, you know, we licensed, well, I think that there's probably an interesting and, and elegant way to credit people who have contributed. The real complication is like, how do you know how much one individual has contributed? Um, and I don't like, Th that's pretty hard problem to solve. Like how, what percentage of, of like the overall, you know, you, you know, if you take, you know, a billion data points, like what percentage have you and I contributed? I don't know that there's an actual good way of knowing that. Um, but I do think there's a future where the work that we do, like find, like you can imagine a world where OpenAI has an app store of sorts and people who are contributing to that environment get credit for, like the prompts they're designing, the apps they're designing, et cetera. The other problem, and sorry, just one other, the other problem here is in history, none of us have ever given financial credit. Like we write, like I didn't give financial, when I, when I, you know, I, when I, you know, I wrote a bunch of stuff in college and like the person who, you know, the people I cited didn't get financial credit. And we have this like history, where like we don't actually have a good system of uh, like, there's royalties, which which Hollywood is based on, but it's like a really perverse system. Um, and we, there, we don't have a really good, like apart from citing, we don't actually have a good way of like, we, we've basically just been, you know, default, you know, thanking, um, complimentary thanking people for a long time. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a weird problem. We've got a question from a Josh here. Uh, will the model be trained on more recent data, fresh data, like post 2021? How do you think about kind of the weighting of, um, data that the model's trained on. Yeah, on on regarding model weighting, there is a like there is this risk of recency bias. Um, so you you know, there, and there are people much smarter than me who work on that. I think you could imagine a world where a model is you know connected to an internet. All right, I'm going to throw out a, unless we see anything else come through here, a kind of a last question. Uh, and this was about advice for for founders who are you know clean sheet you know, really trying to bring an innovation to market, leveraging in this inflection point in AI, uh, which is which is foundation models and all the potential, you know, that's unlocked through it. What would you recommend to this group? 
Well, let me answer the let me answer a question that someone asked me earlier today, which I thought was was pretty good. Which is like, how would if you had if like if you quit your job tomorrow, what would and you wanted to do that? You wanted to work in this? Where would you start? Like, what would you do? And I I have never struggled to answer a question um, that I that feels so simple. More I think, but what I would say is right now there's an incredible groundswell like there's a bunch of garbage honestly on twitter and linkedin about like you know 50 ways to better use chat gbt and there's like a ton of noise that's i think really distracting and honestly like this meta concern that we're actually just going to inundate ourselves in, in bad content but there are some really exciting things happening in both our forum and the open source communities right now um and um, in uh, startup communities. And if you are connected to founders, uh, founder communities, I, it, there's, I've never seen more energy in, um, in startup communities in, my, in the 15 years I've been in the Bay Area. Um, and I basically encourage anyone who's ever thought about starting a company um, or who's like, you know, thinking about it to get involved now through any means possible. I mean, the the accelerators are like, are, you know, at capacity. I mean, the, you know, every, like everyone is, again, I live in San Francisco, I'm a little biased, but San Francisco does feel like the energy is shifting. People are coming back. There are just far more events and go and like, just start connecting in these forums and in these, in these spaces to find like-minded people. Um, and every, cause every time I, I, you know, I go, you know, go to some dinner, go to some place, there are people just thinking of the most incredible ways to deploy this stuff. And it's it's all updating really quickly, so that's I don't know maybe lazy advice, but I think it's the best I can give um, at this point because you know there's just there's so much there's so much noise elsewhere, but there's a ton of really exciting stuff happening in Groundswell, um, which is really cool. And to the extent that you get good at this stuff, if you don't want to work at a startup, I have a lot of friends who are now more risk averse than ever, who are like, hey, I really want to work in AI, but I don't want to work at a startup. Every enterprise right now is hiring you know, um, prompt engineers, AI experts, ML engineers, and developers to help build, integrate this stuff into their, into their technologies. And I mean, I, you know, there's, there is no shame in that. If you've got, if you've got a mortgage and a family and you're like, Hey, startup life is too risky. Like there's a ton of stuff to be built with. Um, there, I think it's never been more exciting to build in an enterprise in some respect, because they all have to go reinvent themselves now. Zach, thank you so much. This was the perfect way to kick off our speaker series. Thank you, and, uh, and we'll wrap up this session.